All right. Our long march of the history of China in the name of creating the modern Chinese state really takes a turn. Um, we ended the last lecture with kind of the death of Mao and the chaos that was kind of established after his death between the ruling factions of the, the communists who all had ties back to the, the long march and the, the winner of that, that battle were the moderates and, uh, the leader of the group was, was Deng Xiaoping. So we will look at his influence on kind of cobbling elements of China back together after the, the death of Mao and his influence on the creation of, of China now. Uh, so Deng Xiaoping had a famous quote. He said, uh, it doesn't matter whether a cat is white or black, as long as it catches mice. Which is an interesting quote, and I want you to try and tell me what you think uh, Xiaoping's argument is with this quote. So, pause the video, take a guess, and we'll talk about it again in a second. So, you are seeing the battle of socialism versus capitalism, pure socialism versus pure capitalism, or elements of mixing these two systems play its way out together. And uh, if we remember from the previous slide, Deng Xiaoping was one of the ones who was pushing for market economic reforms, even while Mao was still alive, and, and uh, Deng Xiaoping's argument is, is simple. It doesn't matter if a policy is socialist or capitalist. The name of the game is economic growth to put China on uh, equal, sorry, equal to or similar footing with the, the rest of the world. So the name of the game is economic strength. It doesn't matter if it's capitalist or communist. So 1979, uh, he takes uh, control of, of power and the interesting thing is to know that uh, Deng was uh, purged twice by Mao. He was you know purged as a threat, reinstated, then purged again and then moderate leaders brought him back uh, because they think he had some pretty solid ideas on uh, how to make China uh, a little bit more economically successful. He wanted to modernize China in four elements, industry, agriculture, science, and the military. And we'll talk about these areas uh, in, in a second. But he really wanted to embrace what's called an open-door trade policy. Uh, he wanted to trade with everyone, including capitalist nations like the United States, that Mao's egalitarian goal of you know self-sustaining communities where everybody was perfectly equal was nice, but too utopian. That... China was a little late to the party in the, the name of industrialization and that they're going to have to rely on modes of economic interdependence to get what, what they need. Uh, there are some you know, interesting pictures of, of Deng uh, after meetings with leaders of the U.S. where you can see him wearing a cowboy hat uh, that I'll post on Classroom or you can find online because it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, he wanted to reform education. So he wanted to straight up reverse the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution was, you know, a 10, 15 year bash on liberal academics and, you know, kind of, you know, the burning of universities and libraries. But uh, he did not see that education was as bad or as divisive as Mao did. So he wanted to raise um, academic standards. He wanted to expand higher education uh, and he wanted to expand research, right? Because if the name of the game is to make China great, to restore China to uh, a position of power and to put them on equal footing with the rest of the world, then you need to be academically competitive uh, so you can be innovative to, to challenge everybody else. And then he was finding uh, old trappings of the legal system or the bureaucracy of, of old China. So... Deng is a bit of a revolutionary in, in and of itself where, 
you know, he is pushing for progress, right? That he is reversing some of the, the bad policies of Mao, uh, but he's doing it by utilizing kind of reactionary political beliefs of kind of restoring elements of China that allowed China to be prosperous or successful uh, in an earlier period of time. So he does uh, a handful, uh, a handful of things to kind of institute market reforms. Um, so he uses um, a socialist market economy system, and the the first thing that he does is instill what's called household responsibility. And household responsibility is kind of an elimination of these egalitarian communities uh, where people were growing things, where people had the backyard furnaces, uh, where they wanted to make people feel like they were stakeholders again and that they could make things for themselves in addition to, to others. So in under the household responsibility system, uh, villages still owned farmland, but the local government could contract land out to, to families so they could produce things that they needed. So the goal would be giving people land um, to produce things that they needed to to pay taxes or their contract fees to the government. But then they could sell things on in, in the open market. They could either consume uh, the excess of what they produced or they could sell uh, to start making some of the money of their own. So this is where you're seeing um, elements of a mixed economic system because the government still owns the land, still owns the means of production, but once you've met your social burden of paying your fees, your taxes, the things that you were asked to produce, you then could start accumulating small elements of your um, own wealth. Other elements of, of market liberalization that you're seeing is the birth of the special economic zone. Uh, special economic zones are regions where foreign investors have preferential tax rates and other incentives. The goal was to lure um, other nations in uh, to China to help with production to help uh, kind of raise their economic standing and the SEZs, SEZs were successful and they're still uh, things that are used today. Then you see the the birth of TVEs or township and village enterprises um, and these are market-oriented public enterprises that are controlled by local governments. So things like iron, steel, cement, fertilizers, the birth of hydroelectric power and farm tools, um, that this model thrived from 1978 to 1996, where, uh, again, these entities were still owned uh, by, by the government, but management decisions were delegated to to, to managers of these enterprises. So you're still seeing, you know, command elements. You're still seeing state ownership, state control, but you're seeing liberalization of this pra these practices because more people are allowed to make economic decisions. He was hugely successful. Uh, China, from 1990 to 2009, uh, their GDP per capita grew at an average rate of about 9% per year. And to put this in perspective, the United States, during that same 19-year uh, period of time, grew at about 1.5% per year. So for more than two decades, China was the fastest growing major economy in the world. And we know uh, that over the summer of 2016, we saw some hiccups in China's economy, which we'll talk about at the end, but Deng's policies were massively successful in creating the economic growth that China was clamoring for. But there were some problems. Uh, under uh, Deng Xiaoping, you see the erosion of the iron rice bowl. Uh, the iron rice bowl were cradle to grave, ben grave benefits. Under Mao, you were guaranteed uh, of lifetime employment the income you needed, and then basic cradle-to-grade benefits like health care and other types of social services uh, to most uh, urban and rural workers. Um, 
you were giving housing assistance, you were giving daycare, you were giving anything that you needed to allow your family to thrive, but also be economically productive. And this kind of starts to to go away in the name of, of market liberalization. While you are seeing um, economic growth, you are seeing elements of unemployment and economic inequality start to rise, and uh, you're seeing kind of a correlation between the erosion of some of the state-owned enterprises uh, and levels of unemployment, mostly tied to uh, the, the collapse of the Iron Rice Bowl. You also are starting to see um, an internal migration problem. You are seeing the kind of growth of what's known as the floating population. Uh, the floating population is around 150 million people. Um, and these are peasants migrating to urban areas to kind of find work. Um, and just like migrant workers uh, anywhere else in the world, these people um, want to need to find jobs for economic productivity. They are willing to take low wages, um, which will disaffect people who see a higher market value of themselves, who don't want crappy low-paying jobs, um, and that these people still today fill important roles. Uh, but in China, it's the in the construction uh, sector in that part of the labor market, whereas we tend to use elements of a floating population in the United States or a migrant population of external uh, immigrants for things like farm. What is leading to uh, this notion of the floating population is some problems with what's called the Hoku system. Uh, in the 50s, you had to be registered as a citizen who was allowed to work or live in a specific location. So it was not just, you know, citizens of China being, you know, citizens of China, that they were being licensed to work in a particular area. Um, and that makes sense in the name of trying to manage a population and make sure everybody stays employed in an area. Um, but this leads to uh, developments of economic inequality because if people are forced to stay in an area to be, you know, producers, uh, and we know that more wealth is starting to rise up in the urban areas that farmers and people living in rural areas are going to be locked out because they're not going to be allowed to travel or work in areas where they're not registered. Um, Authorities have la allowed some migration because um, they needed more people for construction jobs in kind of these rapidly expanding urban areas. Uh, but the people who are part of this floating population, they have no rights in uh, urban areas, that you have no right to an education, uh, that there's no uh, health guaranteed access to health care, and you can be evicted uh, by a government by the local government simply because you're not registered to be there. So those are some of the kind of the, the, the downfalls of, of economic success and modernization championed for by, by Deng Xiaoping um, that China still does deal with all four of these today. Uh, like I said at the top of the first lecture, we've seen strong correlations between economic liberalization and political liberalization. Um, and people were kind of expecting more democracy in China as markets were being liberalized, as the economy was becoming uh, freer, and it, it didn't happen. And I think this political cartoon kind of is a play off the phrase that we hear um, a lot of free market conservatives in the United States make. Um, you hear them, you hear those people make the argument, the freer the market, the freer the people. Um, but because of kind of a long-standing tradition of authoritarianism, or kind of the focus of the hierarchical structure of the Chinese Communist Party, you are seeing, you know, Deng push, push for free markets, but not people. So this leads to um, kind of the infamous Tiananmen Square protests in 1989. Um, where you were seeing people looking for uh, more political change. Uh, 
the army was used to crack down on these protests to silence these people, uh, and the death toll has not been revealed. If you've seen the infamous Tank Man uh, video clip where the man is kind of standing in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square and the tank tries to drive around him and he runs in front of the tank, uh, that this is, you know, highly, highly censored and it's still very taboo to talk about in China today. Uh, <coughs> in the contemporary issues set of notes, we'll kind of talk about the amount of internet censorship that plays its way out in China, and you can't do a Google search for the Tiananmen Square massacre or anything uh, related to Tiananmen Square in, in China because they don't want you to look at something bad that's been by done by uh, the state. And I'm actually going to have you watch a Frontline uh, documentary on uh, Tank Man and on kind of the Tiananmen Square protest so you can see where this is kind of different from... Uh, pushes for democratic reform in other countries throughout the world or, you know, why people in China wanted one thing and why uh, they got something very different. The last thing that I want you to do uh, before we talk about the connection between uh, Deng Xiaoping and kind of the modern trappings of Chinese leadership is I want you to look at this list of ideas um, and I want you to see if you can tell me if, you know, it is an idea pushed for under Mao, if it's an idea pushed for by Deng, or if it's by both. So pause this and you can either kind of copy this list into your note and make your guess, uh, or you can act like you're going to pause the video and listen to me just awkwardly sit here in silence before I click on to the next slide. So you do what you want. I'm going to awkwardly sit here in silence for a second before I click on the next slide. Alright. So you'll notice that both was a relatively fa false option, right? That the only economic idea that uh, Deng and Mao had in common were that the, the party leadership should not be challenged, right? The notion of the mass line still stays, in fact, kind of a long-standing adherence to authoritarianism is something that they both believed in. So, uh, Deng was the one that favored foreign investment. Mao wanted communes, promised the Iron Rice Bowl. Uh, Deng pushed for the open-door trade policy. Mao was the one who limited education to lower levels. Mao eliminated private property. Deng you know, reversed communes by pushing for household responsibility. Uh, he kind of ended Mao's egalitarianist dream and pushed for a more market element of socialism. Because of kind of the, the philosophy uh, that Deng utilized, especially with his approach to education, you really see a massive transformation in the type of people uh, who were pushed to kind of become leaders in, in China, uh, from Deng Xiaoping even to the, the current uh, ruler Xi Jinping. China uh, has probably progressed into becoming a technocracy now, and this is another one of those Secret Daily Now This, Test Tube News, whatever the hell these people decide to call themselves by the time you watch this video them kind of explaining what a technocracy is in theory, um, and they compare China to what Greece is looking to do or was looking to do uh, to challenge their debt crisis. But we've hit kind of a, a critical area in, in China where we see the rise of technocrats. A technocrat is a career-minded politician, right? That these are bureaucrats who administer public policy but they care more about the technical justification than the political justification. That these are policy experts who want policies that, you know, are rational and not kind of these utopic ideal visions that we saw kind of play their way out under, under Mao. Uh, the three kind of contemporary uh, Chinese presidents, Shang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and Xi Jinping, uh, all become, you know, people that we can consider 
uh, technocrats, that they all had university training in engineering, that they were all groomed by people before them who were in the upper echelons of the Chinese uh, political structure um, to move up kind of in the ranks. So if we talk about the, the current president, Xi Jinping, and we'll look at him again in, in kind of the current issues set of notes, um, he is pushing for what he calls people-centered urbanization, uh, which is trying to like reform the, the, hu, the huoku system, the, the notion of, you know, that work registry where uh, he wants to extend that to 100 million migrants living in cities uh, between 2014 and 2020, and he wants to move 100 million people from cities uh, who are part of this floating workforce back to, to um, rural areas. He also wants to see a massive increase in government investment in housing, schools, hospitals, and public transportation, that infrastructure is kind of the next great challenge um, in China. And uh, if I have the time to do so, I'll put together some mini lectures on uh, Shang Semin and Hu Jintao to kind of look at landmarks and the things that they've done, but really understanding how uh, Deng Xiaoping really changes the direction and the, the, the progression of China after the death of Mao, I think, is kind of the most important thing to kind of understand uh, China in a contemporary political sense. That's all I've got for this set of notes. The next thing we'll start to kind of break down is how the political system in China really tends to operate.